Good evening. Bonjour à tous. Great taquina. My name is Melissa Black, and I am a library planning consultant with the Ottawa Public Library, working on the Ottawa Public Library and Library and Archives Canada joint facility. We believe that it's important to acknowledge that even as we gather here today, um, virtually, we are on unceded and ancestral territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. Nous rendons hommage à tous les premières nations, les Inuits et les Métis, leurs années, leurs ancêtres, et leurs importantes contributions passées et présentes. It's a pleasure to welcome you on behalf of Ottawa Public Library this evening to Art and Our Ancestors, an intergenerational discussion about Indigenous storytelling and artistic practice. With us this evening are Algonquin artists Mari Brakate and her father Simon Brakate, members of Kitigan Zibi Anishinaabeg First Nation. Simon Brakate is an internationally renowned Indigenous artist exploring human sacred relationship to animals and birds. In his artwork, Simon uses a traditional indigenous, indigenous stencil technique called pochoa. Simon Bracopé also practices community-based public art, where people can participate and experience his artworks in everyday life. This is important for the artist who feels that by being closer to the natural world, we fulfill ourselves as human beings. Simon's work has been exhibited in Canada, the United States, Europe, China, and Cuba. His work can be found in the collections of the Canadian Museum of History, the National Art Gallery of Canada, the Royal Ontario Museum, the Ottawa Art Gallery, and the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, DC. Earlier this week, the first Algonquin Wayfinding Wheel designed by Simon was unveiled at the Timothy LRT station, right next to the future location of Ottawa's new central library. The Wayfinding Wheel will be installed at all O-Train stations and other key Ottawa landmarks, with plaques that describe the significance and the depicted animals and symbols to the Algonquin peoples. Mari Bracote, daughter to Simon, was born and raised in Ottawa. Interested in applying her Indigenous culture to her design practice, Mari holds both a Bachelor of Design from Ryerson University in Fashion and Costume Making and a Master of Arts from Central St. Martins in London, England. With the aim of decolonizing research approaches and the design process, she brings traditional knowledge into academic and design spaces. Mari currently works at the National Arts Center as the Indigenous Cultural Residence or NAC Indigenous Theater. This dynamic duo of artists is here with us this evening to discuss how traditional teachings and familiar stories have shaped their creative process and the artistic work they produce. OPL is devoted to sharing remarkable stories and introducing audience is to writers and creators who can inspire and challenge us to explore different perspectives. Be sure to check out other upcoming OPL events, like a discussion with the director of the film, Chaka Pesh, next Monday, June 28th at 7.30, as well as the Rural Road Trip concert series featuring local artists. Head to the Ottawa the Library's website for more information on the wealth of what's available at OPL. Thank you and enjoy the evening. Bonne soirée. Over to you, Marie and Simon. Quay. Uh, thanks, Melissa, for that uh, great introduction. Um, I guess I'll just sort of reintroduce myself a little bit. I'm Mari Brockpe. Uh, I'm uh, a Gonquin from Kitty Gansu First Nation. Uh, and it's really great to be here, especially um, talking about art, which I love talking about, and uh, talking with my dad, who I love working with uh, in, in doing art. Um, and I'll uh, hand it over to him to. Um, give a little introduction about his work uh, and maybe tell a story about one of the pieces that uh, he's done. Quay Quay, it's a pleasure to say I'm Mari's father. Uh, I've got six children, so I got to mention them all. Uh, they're, they're all artists in, in many ways. Uh, I, I guess, uh, you know, storytelling is really interesting. Uh, you know, I think I, I grew up in a household that told stories. Um, my grandmother uh, was always telling us stories. If we, if we were bad boys, uh, she'd be telling us scary stories. Uh, and if we were good, uh, they were good stories. So, uh, you know, as you grow up, uh, you some stories you remember. Uh, sometimes I'm talking to my brothers and they'll say, Oh, you remember that story? And it would remind you of uh, a story that she told. So I'm going to um, uh, 
talk about a piece of art uh, that I did, uh, and it's called uh, the uh, Algonquin Underwater Serpent. And um, so my uh, my grandmother on my mother's side is uh, uh, was Mohawk and uh, Tuscora, and on my father's side, uh, Algonquin or Anishinaabe. And um, I, I really did this uh, uh, painting to honor my my father. Uh, it, you know, he passed away, and each of the little dots represent uh, the the years that he that he lived. And um, he uh, he 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 didn't say a, a lot um, when when we were growing up. He was very quiet. But as he got older, he he started. Uh, telling more and more stories and I was talking to a friend today saying uh, she was going to go visit her dad I said well listen to everything he says ask questions because I I, I felt like I should have done that you know and uh, so he would say things like uh, we'd be out um, uh, hunting so one day we were out hunting and uh, it was in the fall and there and there was this uh, rabbit you know some of the rabbits turn white in the winter it snowed, then it had melted. And I could see this white head sticking up. And so I, I had the 22 that I was giving it, given at the age of 11 and I'm gonna shoot this rabbit. And my dad says, you know, you don't have to kill everything you see, you know? And it, re it reminded me of when we, we would uh, gather medicine and, and he would say, uh, never pick the first medicine that you see, it might be the last. And then always be careful of what you're picking because plants, uh, some plants look, look alike. Uh, so this uh, is a um, uh, underwater serpent and uh, they go up and down the Gitchizippi, you know, the, uh, the Ottawa River. And uh, in this time of the year, actually in early spring, uh, we hear uh, thunder and lightning, you know, and the thunder and lightning uh, the the lightning it comes out of the eyes of uh, the thunderbird, and what the thunderbird's job is in the spring is to uh, scare away these underwater serpents, and um, and and so the parent in me thinks, uh, you know, wh why do you need a uh, thunderbird to scare away the uh, underwater serpent? So it's to tell children that it's safe to play in the water to swim and there and there's a couple of reasons for it you know in the winter uh you, you get all this animal stuff and and then it goes into the water and then uh there's bacteria in the water so it's not safe and also it's rushing so by the time uh thunder and lightning comes uh it becomes safer so it's uh, so that's why i did this uh this character and um uh yeah, so I I, uh, I use a stencil technique, uh, which is an uh, an old Algonquin uh, technique, you, originally done in birch bark, and you would cut out uh, a template or a stencil, and you would put that stencil on on birch bark, and then you would scratch uh, around the stencil, and uh, scratch out a a layer, uh, etch out a layer of uh, the bark, and um, you would create this beautiful image. So anyway, so uh, I'm using storytelling and Algonquin art history, Algonquin art techniques to my art. So I'm gonna give it back to Mari. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've also used um, storytelling within my own work, um, but I, I guess when I was doing my undergrad um, in design, we were, very, we were told a lot to not um, not make it personal. <laughs> As a designer, you're supposed to sort of separate yourself from the work and not sort of expose yourself in the work. I think things have changed since then. But um, so when I was doing my master's, I had um, a bit of an identity crisis <laughs> of, uh, you know, having having all these stories and all this indigenous art in our house and having my dad 
uh, be an artist and tell us stories and, ha and have these amazing things um, surrounding us. Uh, but I was being told like not to integrate it into my artistic practice. And so I went against that in my master's and was like, okay, I'm gonna make this um, really personal and really about storytelling and storytelling about uh, my own life and my family uh, and bringing it together. Um, and that sort of has set me on <laughs> my artistic journey uh, personally. And um, I'll share the, the project that I did, which was uh, a beading project. Um, and it was a beaded varsity jacket uh, that shared a bunch of stories about uh, myself and my family and um, talked about why familial knowledge, traditional knowledge, ancestral knowledge is just as important as what you learn in books or more important in some cases than what you learn in books. Uh, and that is something that you should wear uh, proudly. Um, and so that was my, my main project for uh, my master's degree. And um, one of the, when I was talking to someone from the library <laughs> uh, about uh, our last name, um, uh, I said, oh, it's an interesting story, um, how we got our last name. Uh, and uh, I heard someone say before, like your your names are are the first stories that you have and the first stories that you own. Um, and uh, if you can see see on the sleeve, I have well, I have two two names. <laughs> so I have uh, Brockape and I have Apican uh, on my sleeve. And so those are the the first stories that I sort of carried with me. Um, and so our last name, my dad can can uh, correct me if I'm wrong about <laughs> the story. Uh, but uh, bras coupé is French for bras coupé, uh, to have your arm cut off. Uh, I had a French roommate that um, didn't even clock that it was French <laughs> for months. And then she's like, oh, wow, that is a, a, a pretty crazy last name. Um, and so I, I said to her like it was you know it was from my my ancestors like our, as all of our you know names came from but uh one of our ancestors had uh his arm cut off by jesuit missionaries correct <laughs> uh and uh um got renamed uh uh in the the registry um and uh and people are horrified <laughs> when they hear this story, uh, and especially now. Um, and I always thought of it as a story of like resilience, like, uh, you know, he kept moving forward and their brocopes, you know, still here today to tell the story. Um, but our, our family name was Apican, um, which is also on, on the sleeve. And I think it's important to both know that history of my ancestor and I, I carry that story of my ancestor to now. Um, but then it's also really important to know what our, our you know, actual Algonquin family name was as well. And um, yeah, so that's sort of the first story, <laughs> the first story that I've like incorporated from our family into my work. And, you know, subsequently we've had to have lots of stories in, in, in our work, but um, yeah. I guess uh, we'll we'll talk about sort of the yeah. next piece that was uh... so. So, Mari, do you want me to talk a little bit about it too? Sure. Okay. So uh, there there are many stories, as Mari points out, about our last name uh, Brockape. And uh, the the short version, my dad uh, would say, uh, "Oh, your ancestor wouldn't work for the white man, so they they cut his arm off," which is kind of a interesting story uh uh to think about and and uh what one of our relatives wrote a in french uh a, a novel called le Bracapé. and you and that's got a it's a more romantic kind of a a story how how that name came about uh but i like my dad's story because it's you know short and uh sweet or not so sweet and uh apican uh is the top line on the uh to carry the uh, the the load of a backpack, and uh, you could you could carry hundreds of pounds. And and when you actually look at 
you can't see me here, uh, but uh, when you when you actually look at me physically, I, I I would look like an ancestor that could carry these heavy loads using this stump line. In fact, my brother just gave me one recently, and it's just over there. And um, but I but uh, there's apican and then there's gitchi apican, and it, it it, it could be translated as the big tump line, you know, but but I I think uh, another way of looking at it uh, is that it it could have a um, a spiritual context to it, you know, uh, like you say, Gitchi Manitou, you know, the 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 great spirit. And uh, anyway, so I'm in my mind, I'm thinking about that. What does that name uh, mean? So one of these days. Um, uh, I'll uh, I'll come to some kind of a semi conclusion about that, but it, it's a kind of thing that you think about a lot. I don't know if Mari does, but uh, well, it sounds like she has. Anyway, yeah. so I'll th <laughs> turn it back to you. I do think about it a lot. Yeah. Uh, um, I guess what one of the other uh, pieces that uh, we'll go through a few pieces that we've worked on collectively because um, those are just individual work. Uh, which is what uh, Melissa was talking about is the um, wayfinding symbol, which we've been working on since 20, either 2013 or 2014. I can't even remember now, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll share what it looks like because there's one actually in place now. And we can actually talk about it because we haven't really been able to talk about it that much publicly. Um, but this was a, a, a collaborative process. Um, in that I, I did the, the digital renderings of it and, and you did the, the, the drawings and the consultation. Um, but I guess uh, you could tell, tell us more about, I guess, the process of this project and also maybe a bit of the stories behind, maybe not all of the pieces. There is a video about that. I don't <laughs> want to find it, but <laughs> maybe one of the pieces of, of this thing, because it is about storytelling and storytelling about Algonquin territory. So uh, yeah, so the, <clears throat> there's a, actually an animation uh, that uh, uh, my daughter Claire did. Uh, I think you can find it on the, the uh, City of Ottawa website. So it animates the whole thing. Uh, you know, I think uh, first we should say uh, that it's on a boulder. So the, the, if you can imagine, uh, we, we've got this uh, wayfinding symbol uh, the the original wayfinding uh, symbol was the boulder. Um, so people would say, "Well, I'll meet you at Pimisi Station uh, next to the boulder." You know, the orange boulder that you see there, the red boulder. And uh, so historically, these these boulders uh, uh, would be wayfinding the wayfinding symbol itself. And um, the whole region is full of these boulders uh, that uh, came from uh, my um, uh, Mari's uh, sisters, other sisters, the older ones. Asked my dad one day, uh, you know, where did all these boulders come from? And he says, oh, it just one of these one day it just rained these boulders all over the place. So the uh, if you can imagine the boulder, it really is the symbol that we want you to look at. So we got this uh, uh, design, and um, you know I think it says my you know the art done by uh, uh, Simon Brock, the Algonquin and Anishinaabe artist. But the truth is, uh, Mari did most of the work on this. You know, in terms of you know I sketched it out and and um, and uh, but but she did all the the, the hard work uh, and a lot of the changes. So I think just briefly. Uh, with, without getting a lot of detail, um, I spoke to uh, Algonquin community members and elders about what did they want uh, on this symbol. And so, you know, they wanted transportation. So you got the canoe there, the birch bark canoe. Uh, you can see the, there's like a thing that's kind of going into the canoe. Um, uh, they kind of loop in like this. It's actually a plant that you will find on a um, uh, on the uh, th there you can see it there uh, uh, on birch bark baskets and it's unfurling kind of this spiral uh, plant 
And it, and if you know uh, anything about geometry or engineering, this spiral uh, is a very powerful, uh, not just symbol, but a very powerful um, uh, way of plant. All plants kind of grow out of these spirals. The uh, the four directions. Uh, there's the four directions in there. Uh, there's uh, uh, in the northern part of it is a, uh, a spearhead, and it's a copper spearhead. Uh, I'm really proud of this. You know that uh, you, you know people think uh, that uh, indigenous people are primitive people. Uh, it's really not true. And um, uh, this is a copper a spear point that goes back 5,500 years uh, with, where our ancestors would have uh, flattened the copper, folded it like they make those uh, Japanese swords and to make these uh, arrowheads. And, uh, and then there's all the animals. So I kept going to elders and said, what kind of animals do you want? And, they, and I think I stopped when I, I thought, there's no way I'm gonna get all these animals on there. So we start with a turtle. So we live on the turtle's back, underwater uh, animals, uh, uh, animals that live in the in the water, you know, like the beaver, and then birds on the water, and then uh, uh, mammals, little small mammals, to bears, to uh, wolves, uh, deer, moose, and then birds in the sky right up to the uh, eagle. Anyways, I so. Um, uh, you know, I, I would draw these out and Mari really did the hard work of actually creating, you know, the, the, the image. And I think we did this long distance. You, I, you were going to university somewhere. So I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, I think we, well, I, I was, I start, I was in Toronto when we started it. There was a chunk of time I was in Ottawa for it. And then I was in England for some of it. I think we finalized it when I was in, in, in England, um, and then it then it waited to be unveiled for years. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was definitely. I mean, the the way the way in which the project was collaborative was collaborative on like multiple ways, like you with the elders, and then me with you um, to get to the final the final point. So it's 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 not it's not one point of view. It's I think it. It carries a lot of different people's knowledge uh, within within the symbol itself, um, but it was a fun process. <laughs> and I think the uh, you know the colors. I should point out the colors, uh, uh, beautiful colors. And um, so I I, I kind of said, oh well, here here's the colors. But Mari worked uh, with her mother Carol on the colors, so they were in with these colors swatches selecting the colors so um you know i think it, it yeah. you know the colors really make it yeah i i in a very designer uh tendency i think there's probably about 15 different final um final versions of the the file but it was a i think we went through maybe five different reds in the background i think we went through maybe 10 different backgrounds but it was um Long, long process, but I think worth worthwhile. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess and, sort of. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, and I and I guess uh, we keep going. People are uh, we're, we keep going back to the symbol, but um, the uh, it's it's made out of this aluminum and it's etched, uh, and then the colors are baked onto the uh, uh, onto the symbol. So it it, uh, it was done here in Ottawa. So. It, even that was a, a process uh, and um, it, it was uh, managed by our project. We have a project manager for all these things. Her, her name is Carol. So Mari's mother. <laughs> um, I guess sort of con continuing on from that, um, another, another piece that is also at Pimacy Station um is uh these birch bark bedings but i guess we'll, we'll start with just birch bark biting in general i think it was probably the first um indigenous art 
form I was introduced to, like even before beating. Um, right. But we had a, there's a birch tree at the end of our street. And I remember we'd go like sledding or go to the park <laughs> and we would get birch bark and then you would show us birch bark biting. And I totally, like, I just thought it was just whatever, <laughs> what everyone did. Um, and uh, not a lot of people do it. Um, I guess I'll explain what, what birch bark biting is. Um, it's uh, really thin sheets of, of birch bark, like very thin, like almost thinner than paper. If, when you sort of peel, peel bits from a tree um, and then it's folded like a paper snowflake. Uh, and then you use your teeth to um, perforate. Well, perforate is not quite the right word because it doesn't really perforate it. It kind of indents it, I guess, uh, to create a pattern or a design. And those designs were used traditionally for sort of uh, ways to tell stories or they were used as um, beadwork patterns. Um, and yeah, it's something that, we've integrated in a lot of our work in the last few years. Yeah, I think, um, well, uh, uh, it, bir uh, birch bark biting is a really good way to pass on its storytelling, you know, to s tell stories. And uh, uh, I, uh, Mari and all my children have learned how to do uh, birch bark biting. I, I've done birch bark biting with my uh, my grandchildren. I've got um, uh, my daughter Sarah has three three daughters, and my daughter Emily has two boys and one daughter. And uh, the the one's a baby, so she's not birch bark biting yet. But the, they'll all. I don't think she has teeth yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I think she's got two. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, this one, what, what's interesting about birch bark? biting is, you know, when you're working with um, Anishinaabe uh, people, Algonquins, they really understand uh, kind of the process. And the process is, you know, it's like uh, you, uh, you you make a snowflake. So you, you fold it and then you bite it. You make these impressions that you can see here. But when you're actually doing it, uh, you don't actually, it's not like an artist, you, you, know, you don't actually see the, uh, the impression you're making because it's in your mouth and the uh a lot of the algonquin people that that, that i've uh done workshops with say you know it's a creator is creating this art with you uh uh by this process of biting and it, you can see these tp designs the, those in my mind were going to be like uh sky domes and uh they turned out into this uh TP design and it's called women and children dancing around the sun. You can see the women and children. And so when people look at it, they they say, oh, uh, I can see a buffalo head in there. If you can see the buffalo head, uh, th they see teepees, uh, they see the star blanket. And for me, you know, that uh, uh, star blanket symbol uh, is for a lot of indigenous people, the Pallades, which is uh, the seven sisters uh, and uh, a lot of indigenous people say that 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 is the gateway between the physical and the spiritual world so this uh, uh, image ha has a lot of meaning for a lot of different people and this one is uh, uh, what I think the National Gallery is going to be opening soon uh, you can see this in the National Gallery's um, Canadian and Indi Indigenous Gallery. It's on exhibit now, along with three other birch bark bitings that look just as new as this, uh, but they're over hundred years old. And it's because uh, el elders say that this bark is alive. It's still alive, uh, even though it's been taken from the tree. And I know when Mari and uh, uh, my other children were taking this bark, it didn't kill the tree. There's there's a way of taking the bark without killing the tree. Unmute myself. Um, yeah, and uh, this that was your piece. 
um, this is my piece, one of my pieces um, of, uh, of chickadees um, going to some flowers. Um, we have a, a bird feeder and there's a lot of chickadees that <laughs> come by now. I'm like, I've, I've invited them, um, but I love chickadees and they're, they're all over our neighborhood. Um, and yeah, I, I've, I've definitely gotten better at birch bark biting in the last, I would say maybe five years. Um, but people always ask, how do you know what you're doing? Like, oh, I don't totally know what I'm doing. Um, I think I always come, come in there with something in mind. I mean, I like flowers. I think <laughs> for a lot of the work I do recently has been um, involving lots of plants. Um, and so usually it ends up being something floral. Um, but uh, as this one has, but I, I don't, I don't know what I'm necessarily doing when I start. And um, yeah, it is definitely the the creator coming through to sort of give you something in the end. And I, I think this one, I, I when I bit it, I was like, oh, I don't know, if it's gonna look any good. And I opened it up, and I was like, I love it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we have sort of lots of lots of stories of chickadees um, in in our teaching and I remember we were elders and they were they were talking about the chickadees and how they make different sounds in every season because uh, they're around every season um, which I think you also talk about in in the the storytelling around the uh, the wayfinding symbol um, as well um, but they're they're a great little a great little bird and you you see them all the time in Ottawa so it's nice to honor them um, in, in work. Um, but, uh, you know, as we said, we, we've taken these, these pieces and uh, I got really into uh, rhizo printing. Um, uh, I got really into rhizo printing in the, uh, when I was in London and um, I was like, we need to do something in rhizo. <laughs> Uh, so we ended up making uh, the first thing I did in Rhizo, uh, which is a, uh, a sort of um, mass printing process that has, uh, it, it, they make a stencil, which I, I liked that it was similar to um, the type of art that my dad makes and also uh, to, to um, uh, birch bark basket designs. I liked, I liked the idea of stencil. Uh, and then it it takes ink and it runs over over it. Uh, so each color is a different stencil, um, and so they're they're layered up. But so the first thing we did was to digitize um, my dad's birch bark biting and made it into a riser print. Yeah, that was fun. It took how long? It was like over a year that we, uh, we worked on it. Because I remember uh, we were vacationing in Scotland and. I, you had printed out all these things and I had watercolor and I was um, coloring them in to see what colors uh, it should be. And then, uh, so you've got the birch bark uh, slashes in the, in the background and then the, the birch bark biting digitize as one layer. And what I like about this, there's two uh, types of birch bark art techniques. One is the biting itself and then the other is the template that I talked about earlier, or, or this, yeah, kind of a, yeah, a template, a cutout. And so this combines both the, the biting and the cutout technique. And uh, we, we did them in seasons. And, uh, I, you know, I think the, when you, when you actually look at it, it the other thing I liked about this, the Rhizo was, it, it, it was a, a it's a digital, a digitized or a digital uh, uh, process, and it, it's it's like um, uh, serial graphs, but also it it, it comes from an old technique, uh, Gestetner, which is an old you know people that are my age know what that smells like. It, it's it's got an alcohol based ink, and when I looked at when I looked it up on the internet, I saw spirit printing. But it, I thought it was like, you know, spirit like we're thinking, but it was actually spirit like alcohol. Anyway, but uh, got pretty excited about it. It's a really nice uh, technique to to work with, because, again, 
uh, you don't have as much control uh, over the uh, the final artwork. The the process takes control over it. And uh, anyway, so there there you go. Enough said. Yeah, I um, the, the version of of mine. Um, yeah, sort of it's it's offset printing. So it's uh, even if you want things to align, they may not align. Like it's there, there's that sort of space for uh, variable, uh, which in virtual work fighting, like it's all variable. <laughs> you just, you, you, even if you try really hard, um, there will be variable because you it's doing something without seeing it. Um, and I just liked how there is a lot of similar, similar qualities in birch bark biting and basket making and uh, the printmaking process um, that really spoke to one another. And, and when we're talking about intergenerational knowledge sharing and talking about, you know, the seven generations and, you know, taking this, I would maybe argue one of the earliest forms of uh, mark making uh, and art making in North America um, and birch bark biting and the taking something that is a relatively new printing process um, and and showing that you know these things can still still speak to one another today um, and that those stories can still carry on and those philosophies can still carry on uh, in art in in various ways um, maybe philosophizing <laughs> about uh, risograph making um, but uh, yeah then then these dig the the digital drawings were then taken and uh, made into uh, sort of window art at Pimacy Station. They're very subtle. <laughs> a lot of people are like, I didn't even know that they were there, um, which I kind of like. They're they're just this little subtle subtle piece on the windows um, uh, at the station. And my sister's one is there as well. <laughs> yeah, Claire's is on the left. Yeah. So, but I guess what I like about uh, uh, birch bark biting is uh, if, if you look at Claire's or at Mari's, uh, it shows a relationship between uh, birds and plants. Uh, in some birch bark biting, you'll see an insect and a flower. So it's telling people that, that there's a relationship uh, between, uh, you know, between, in, you, we need and absolutely need insects to pollinate the flowers. Uh, we, we need insects to pollinate uh, a lot of the foods that we eat, you know, like corn. And uh, uh, so, so it's teaching us something. And, it, you know, the four sacred directions, uh, the interrelationship between things. Uh, today, I was just at the uh, National uh, uh, Art Gallery, and they're, they're, they've kind of uh, uh, creating a new symbol for the uh, National uh, Gallery of Canada. And, um, and it's uh, an Algonquin word, uh, and, and kase, which means interrelationship. And everything's relate, everything is related to uh, everything that's around us. And I think that's what these three uh, images uh, uh, teach us and tell us. Another uh, project that we worked on <laughs> together uh, was this uh, scarf. Um, this is not the physical scarf, but the, the digital print of the scarf um, that we did for the National Arts Center uh, for the Mushkomo Festival um, for the opening of, um, uh, of Indigenous Theater. I work for Indigenous Theater. Um, and uh, it sort of encapsulates what it what Mushkomo um, meant, and uh, we talk uh, a lot about uh, you know storytelling and also going to community to get uh, to to learn stories. And this was one of the processes that you know we un undertook. Um, I undertook it for work. And, oh, my dad joined me. <laughs> he didn't have to, but he joined me um, to meet with language speakers um to to gift us a name for the festival and i uh, i had uh, i had looked in we have a algonquin lexicon and 
uh, I looked in it and I was like, I think this is the word. <laughs> and I, I went to them and explained what, um, what, why I liked the word. Um, and uh, I was saying, you know, like, like the arts, um, you know, we've been sort of indigenous arts has been around. We've been doing the work and people have been telling the stories and sharing the stories, but they haven't had necessarily the light uh, or the spotlight um, to tell those stories. And um, the word that I, I liked what had that sort of vibe to it. <laughs> I think it was like uh, something to do with currents or something underneath the water. Um, and, uh, and then I also, our, our first season, um, had a lot of uh, women um, playwrights in it. And uh, I liked the idea of water and women as water keepers. And I liked the water and the NACs by the water. It was all good. <laughs> uh, and then I went there and I told them this and they said, no, you cannot have that word. <laughs> it kind of sounds like this word and I do we don't like that word. Um, I was like, oh, I was very disappointed. Um, but then, the, but then the the language speakers talked to one another and they were like we have it it the the word is mushkomo uh and uh the elder uh joe got out of his seat and he was he was telling a story in in this one word of uh he's like mushkomo it means you know something something is just under the water and 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 it reveals itself uh to everyone and like just in that word, there was so much story within it. And that was what I found so interesting about indigenous languages. They're like, they have amazing words that have, are really, have really deep meaning in just one, you know, three syllables. <laughs> uh, so when we were there, um, we, you know, received that, that name uh, and we were, uh, we were asked to make uh, a scarf um, for the event. And so this sort of uh, talks or speaks to that naming. Um, yeah, I don't know, Dad, if you want to speak more to, to the design of it. Yeah, I, I just love the, uh, I love the word. Because uh, as soon as uh, he said Bushkabu, I, I thought, you know, you're looking at the water and, and he said, it doesn't matter what pops up, it could be a fish or it could be an otter uh, and and when they pop up uh they're that must that's got to be the first theater you know like it, they're they're entertaining you but they're also there their stories so you look at the you know you got a beaver there and uh, when we were doing the paddle making uh, uh workshop for uh workshops for pimacy paddles uh I, I was told more than once you know that algonquin's you know, Algonquins didn't always have canoes. And uh, one day somebody was uh, uh, cleaning this um, uh, beaver and they opened it up and you could see the chest cavity, all these ribs. So the person got inspired. Oh, uh, beaver can swim really well. We're gonna make a canoe uh, like the beaver's ribs. And then uh, even more than that, the tail becomes the, you know, we have two types of paddles, uh, the uh, uh, beaver tail design, and the otter tail. So there's a beaver and, a, and there's an otter there. Um, the uh, otter was interesting too because uh, uh, th there's a bear there that's our, which is our clan, but also uh, the bear uh, had uh, years ago had this uh, uh, council where he got all the animals and asked the animals, "What can you teach human beings?" And the otter said, "I can teach them how to get along, unity." And you can see in the water these these uh, waves that go up and kind of up and down. And if you look at the sand uh, and the beaver's tail, it goes up and down. And relationships are like that. You know, relationships aren't a, a smooth ride. It, you know, they do go up and down. And so uh, you look at the this design, and it's absolutely full of Algonquin stories. Uh, even the little heart, uh, there's a heart in there. You'll see that in birch bark baskets. Uh, it could be the heart of Mother Earth. It could be our heart. It could be love. Uh, 
th 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 these symbols have multiple meanings. Yeah, I think that's a uh, you know a good thing to to note about art. I've um, sometimes in in academic spaces, um, we'll say you know no one no one's going to know all those meanings, and I go that's not important. <laughs> We, we know the meaning um, and if people are interested um, they will find the stories and um, so it's nice that it's beautiful but it's also as you said like every element um, speaks to something that we've learned or that we've been told or and and stuff that we're trying to share with others um, uh, through through the design process And then I'll talk about one one last piece, and then we can open up to some questions. <laughs> um, uh, this is some, something I uh, was doing for a, another project, um, which will lead to the the image of the event. Um, but uh, I was looking at old um, old birch bark uh, stencils, and I I always. I always think of like what what is Algonquin design? <laughs> what is what does it mean to be to, to design in uh, an Algonquin style? And I don't think there's necessarily a, a style um, per se, um, but I do think there's sort of philosophy around the design and things that we can sort of harken back to. Um, and one of those things that Algonquins were very good at uh, was birch bark baskets and um, and a lot of those designs have plants on them. As I said before, I love plants. Um, so this, uh, you know, speaks to some of the uh, traditional designs that were were on um, birch bark baskets, uh, which led to, I guess, this this image um, that, uh, which is a, another rhizo, sort of more, more recent rhizo uh, that. Um, my uh, dad and I did um, that. I guess he can he can speak more too. So it, it, you can really see here. Uh, well, not really see. It, I'm, I'm going to tell you about it. Is uh, uh, you know the creative process. So uh, I, Mari was working on a project and she was using these little uh, uh, birch bark. Uh, cutout images and I went whoa that that's going to make a beautiful uh, print so I I, uh, I I I drew these and uh, and then they're folded and then I cut them out with a uh, exacto knife and I and I was telling Mari this will make a this will make a beautiful print and you could see the riso printing uh, you, you can see in the background that there's a light and dark it, it looks like they're folds but that's actually in the printing process. And um, when you look at uh, uh, these thin birch bark uh, uh, sheets, yeah, you'll see that in the, in the uh, birch bark sheets itself. So, uh, it, you know, as artists, uh, 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 ideas that Mari have, uh, I'll pick up on them, uh, or, and it's the same way uh, with her. And then uh, uh, my other, I've got uh, other daughters that are also artists, and they inspire the, the work too in different ways. So th this is a good example between uh, a collaborative uh, process that uh, Mari and I worked on. Um, I just cut it out. She did all the hard work of uh, doing the digitizing, uh, the cut, you know, uh, select. I kind of chose the colors and then she went and uh, did the final color selection because it's, uh, you can't just go by the, the swatches. You got to go by the, the technique. And, uh, and she had these printed, I think in Glasgow, was it? Yeah. There. So it's a printer in Glasgow. But, but what I like about them is that you can, you can kind of create the image uh, digitally online using their software anyways. So they're medicinal plants. Yeah, and I think you know, talking about how you know I'll be working on something, 
or you'll be working on something and it'll inspire inspire our other work. Um, you know, I I you know mentioned a, a lot to people <laughs> that we um, we talk about art a lot uh, and we talk about culture a lot, and not necessarily in the context of like a, a project we're working on, but um, uh, when I was doing my master's, I would I would order books and they would arrive at the house. Um, because it's very hard to order books about Indigenous content in the UK. <laughs> it's probably easier now, but um, they would arrive at the house uh, and I would like get them at Christmas. Uh, but my dad would read them first because <laughs> he'd be like, oh, this is interesting. Uh, and then I, when I finally got them, I would open them up and they, they would already have, you would leave notes in them about what you thought about the book. Um, which also informed my sort of research practice of like, uh, you know, everything is in conversation. Um, you know, I, I don't think I do any work where I don't talk to you or talk to my sisters or talk to my mom about it. Um, or I, you know, look, look at historical stuff or consult with an elder or like, it's, it's always in, in conversation. Um, and in collaboration and intergenerational uh, that this work occurs. Uh, and sometimes they're, you know, they're, the project already has a purpose, but a lot of the time it, it, it doesn't either. And we create some, some great things. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I'm just thinking about uh, uh, Claire's work. Claire, Claire's uh, has, in the past has done videos, well, she still does videos. But uh, she trained uh, 20 Cree speakers how to do interviews and, and videotape. And so they ended up with 130 videos in Cree uh, about uh, uh, land-based healing. Uh, and then uh, uh, another daughter, Emily, has been working with elders, talking to elders about our, our project that she's doing. And they're informing her work uh the, the the yeah so it, you know i think we're all using various processes uh but we're we're uh, uh benefiting from this ancestral knowledge that came from uh our direct ancestors but also from uh elders and knowledge keepers in the in the community but then also passing it on you know uh I'm not going to scare my grandchildren with the stories that uh, my grandmother told me. Maybe I might. I don't know. I won't. Uh, but uh, you know, I think passing all that knowledge uh, is you know is important. Uh, it it uh, helps form identity. Uh, it also helps form uh, resilience uh, in uh, future generations. Mm -hmm. um, if, if anybody has any questions. Uh, feel free to, to ask. Um, we have uh, Indigenous artists have historically been denied recognitions, ha re recognition. How can we help to rectify that? Um, I, I think there, there are a lot of ways. There's uh, finding, there, there's so many Indigenous artists online at the moment, and I follow a ton, and I've, I've never felt more connected <laughs> to, to folks across uh, like Turtle Island that are making amazing things. Um, and I think just sharing people's work and like seeking it out and supporting it um, is one way to do it. Well, and I think the other is, uh, there's a, been a broadening of what is art, you know, like from a European condition, you, uh, uh, position, you, you have uh, visual arts, uh, like painting and then sculpture, but uh, art is much broader than that. It could be beadwork, uh, uh, clothing, making clothing, birch bark baskets, uh, birch bark biting. So, and then uh, as Mari's talking about, I know she's uh, been promoting uh, indigenous women artists and indigenous arts. Um, and um, I, I'm finding out about internet, uh, you know, the, the discussion that you get on the internet, sharing information, oh, this artist is, you got to see this artist's beadwork. 
and the internet becomes a, a good place or a good platform for those kinds of discussions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, someone has asked me if I've done any other clothing based pieces since my uh, varsity jacket for my masters. Um, I, I took a break. <laughs> I took a break from beading for about a year uh, after I finished my master's also reading. It was a lot of reading. Um, yeah, I, I've gotten back into beadwork. Uh, I've gotten into beading lots of pins, not like full garments. Um, although I, I uh, a, another story of I, I, I did gymnastics when I was younger. So I designed gymnastics costumes and then I also learned how to make ballet costumes uh, during my undergrad. Uh, and I'm hoping to do that again, although that's not really indigenous specific, <laughs> um, but I'm sure I'd approach it differently now. Uh, but I've been really into making uh, beaded pins because I, I love beadwork, but I don't have my ears pierced. So I feel uh, left out of, um, a bit left out of, uh, <laughs> of indigenous um, culture because a, a lot of women make a beautiful beaded earrings and I just don't wear earrings. So I make pins to feel included. Um, we have a great question from Lindsay. Uh, you talked about seeing meaning in the birch bark biting. Can you tell, uh, can you talk about uh, ways you read the land uh, for your artistic practice? So I'll jump right into it. So uh, uh, when, when you do a birch bark biting, often there's four directions in it. And uh, human beings, uh, we can, let's look at it as a, uh, a prayer or a thanksgiving, you know, the, so uh, you see the four directions, the sun rises in the east, uh, settles in the west, and then our, our outstretched arms are uh, north and south. So uh, those directions create this uh, kind of medicine wheel. And it, and it, it uh, uh, you could say the land uh, heals us, the land is therapy. And, uh, uh, there's many ways that the simplest way I could explain it is that uh, one direction talking, another direction listening and learning, another direction you're on this journey together, and the and the fourth direction uh, you're healed, and so there's many ways of reading uh, birch bark biting and connecting to the land. I you, we could spend another hour just talking about that well we'll have to plan another <laughs> another session um someone wrote uh historically are some first nations better known as artists than others depending on geography etc um i i would say that there are artists everywhere um but uh historically um there haven't been a lot of um indigenous curators um, that, uh, you know, worked in museums um, and a lot of what was brought to the public um, was brought by, um, by non-Indigenous folks that were trying to sell Indigenous art. Um, so what I think is most widely known um, a lot of the time was gatekeeping, <clears throat> sorry, it was, was gatekeeped and it wasn't necessarily uh, a reflection of what the arts, the art happening across the country. So that there's there's a lot of different reasons why um, certain artistic styles are maybe more known more than others. But there's definitely artists in every community. I don't know, if, Dad, if you have a another response to that. Well, if you, actually, if you look at museum collections, uh, you know you, you see the. Uh, Indigenous art uh, historically it is absolutely beautiful, you know, uh, and uh, all across Canada, every Indigenous nation produced beautiful artwork. Uh, and a, a good friend of mine said, uh, you know, you if you were out hunting, you wore your best clothes because you're making you're making the creator happy, but by, by uh, dressing up, you know. Uh, so, you know, I think all our ancestors did the same thing, is that uh, uh, you honor creation uh, through your artwork. 
and you produce your best artwork uh, to honor your nation and, and the creation and the land that you live in. So that was, I think, the motivation for our ancestors to produce that artwork. And with colonization, uh, those kind of th things uh, uh, faded a little bit. Uh, but today, uh, we're seeing more and more uh, of this beautiful art uh, becoming revitalized. Uh, you, you just see the beadwork that is uh, produced for the uh, National uh, Art Center's uh, 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 Christmas market and the, the spring market this year. Um, and uh, beaters are just absolutely innovative. Uh, they produce beautiful work. Lots of stories are can be told there. Well, I think that that brings us to our our, our last question. Um, and I, I think that's sort of a, a good good way to end. Um, to say, go out, go out and explore uh, Indigenous art uh, and ask questions, because um, I, I think the you know the artists that you interact with, um, they'll they'll let you know the stories behind things, and there there are stories. Um, so th thanks everybody for watching. Uh, thank you to my sister Sarah, <laughs> who says hi, uh, and Ruby and Grace uh, are also very excited to be watching. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, and um, uh, the Ottawa Public Library also has uh, uh, one last event uh, for Indigenous uh, People's History Month. Um, it is a, a movie, um, a film of uh, Justin, Justin Kingsley and Roger uh, uh, Frappier's uh, documentary, uh, Chaka. Pesh, chaka pesh. <laughs> Hopefully, I pronounced that right. Uh, which is happening on uh, June twenty, uh, June twenty eighth. Um, so you can go to their website to find more about that. Uh, thank you, Dad, <laughs> for yeah. for uh, for speaking with me uh, and talking yeah. about art. It's like my favorite thing to do. Uh, do you have any final final statements? Well, uh, just hello to everybody and uh, have a good evening. Uh, Big witch for listening to us, um, we, we should do this more often. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah.